Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, we're running our second um, of our webinar series um, addressed at answering the recruitment challenge. Uh, and today uh, we are focusing on um, graduate employment. Uh, very happy uh, to be joined today uh, by James Corbyn uh, and Matt Cook from the University of Kent. Uh, James is the head of the careers and employability there, uh, and Matt is the employer engagement manager. Um, so they have a real insight um, on how uh, or on what opportunities their graduates look for uh, and the graduate recruitment market, particularly uh, locally, uh, which they will um, fill us in with um, over the next uh, next few minutes that we're together. Uh, for those that don't know me, uh, my name's Antonio Fletcher. Uh, I'm a partner uh, in the employment team here at Braciers, uh, and uh, very much, uh, as I say, happy to be hosting today's session. Um, in terms of what we'll look to cover off, um, I'll just deal with the introduction um, of the uh, of the session and a bit of background information um, to set the scene. Uh, and then James and Matt will be talking us through um, the graduate labour market, uh, how to attract uh, top talent uh, and the support uh, that, uh, for example, the University of Kent um, is able to provide uh, to employers. Um, by way of introduction, um, I'm, I'm conscious um, that uh, there may well be businesses um, who are in attendance who, or who regularly attend um, our webinar sessions that, that may not have ever looked to the graduate recruitment market. Um, but it's important to, to, to be aware that it is actually a very accessible market for employers, large and small. Um, and I've, I've pulled up some government statistics um, here. Um, so, for example, um, one recent uh, one recent statistic there is that only 66% of graduates are actually in what is considered to be high skilled uh, employment. So it may not, uh, if you've perhaps not looked at graduates thinking, actually, I'm not sure we have roles that are suited to graduates. That's that's an interesting statistic to bear in mind that actually that you've got a, a third of the graduate uh, market that aren't in what is classified as a high skilled employment role. Um, also particularly interesting that, that last year 14% um, of working age graduates were actually not in employment at all. Um, now both of those statistics obviously um, compare favourably for graduates compared to uh, non-graduates uh, on the whole but it's still um, a, um, a an interesting uh, potential um, uh, market of um, uh, of resources that you might not have tapped into yet that might be available to you. Uh, in terms of median salaries um, for working age graduates, um, that stands at about £35,000. Um, that is higher, but not dramatically higher um, than the average salary in the UK, uh, generally anyway. Uh, and um, when you're looking at entry level graduates, uh, the government statistics actually um, say it is £25,000. Um, however, um, having spoken to James and Matt, actually, they've got a different perspective on that, that actually say that entry level roles are actually quite commonly um, lower um, than, than those, those statistics suggest. Perhaps those are boosted by um, particular roles that graduates uh, undertake in, in, in certain businesses. Um, just looking back slightly as well, um, and the importance of this session, I think, for, for all um, all businesses and clients um, of our firm, um, we touched on the current challenges um, that, that are faced throughout all sectors at the moment in our last session, uh, which uh, my colleagues Catherine and Colin um, presented. Um, they talked about exploring alternative candidate markets of which um, the graduate recruitment market may well be uh, one that you've not considered previously. Um, also, they, sp they spoke very much about creative employment arrangements, looking to 
um, move away from the traditional um, focus of uh, of employment towards um, a more flexible approach, perhaps one that is more um, attractive to graduates um, and, uh, 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 and and perhaps the younger generations as well um, that are coming through the workforce generally. Um, clearly, the, the the way things are at the moment with the labour shortage, there's greater competition to attract talent, um, so needing to be um, conscious of that and uh, in how you present roles, in how your organisation um, portrays itself um, for that market generally and ensuring that you've got strategies in place to attract talent um, but also retain the talent that you have because that, uh, that, that clearly is also a key consideration that if you're, if you're losing skilled members of the workforce and then having to go out into market um, to to replace them, then it will be even more challenging uh, than than potentially uh, it, it would have been in the past. Um, so thinking about things like what does the new workforce value um, becomes increasingly important in in how you present a role, in how you present yourselves as an organisation, and how you um, attempt to attract um, that talent uh, into in, into your organisation. Um, some of these points, as I said, were covered off um, in our previous webinar, so that that is the first uh, that was the first one, sorry, of um, a series we are now hosting. There will be um, further sessions within the new year, and, and some of these points will be covered um, both today and uh, and in, in 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 future sessions that we that we run on this series. Um, I'll also add that. Um, we've got uh, a fair amount of time set aside today uh, for, for Q&A uh, at the end of the uh, session. So please, um, you've got a chat and a question um, option um, there um, on, your, on your control panel uh, for the webinar. Please put in any questions um, that, you would, uh, that you would like to ask um, either Matt or James or even myself. Um, and we'll be uh, very happy to answer them at the end. Uh, so please just type those questions in throughout. Um, I'll look to hand over now to James um, so that he can um, he can um, look to begin his presentation. James, have I handed over? The present. Oh no, I think I have passed that to Matt. My mistake. There we go. There we go. And hopefully you can Brilliant. all see the presentation up now. Is that right? Yes. Perfect. Thank you, James. Fabulous. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my um, name on the bottom of the screen says Matt. Apologies. That's because. I've accidentally used Matt's link to get in, but I, I am James. I'm the, the head of careers and employability at the University of Kent. Uh, and I'm you know, very grateful for the opportunity to, to speak to you about what's going on uh, at universities in terms of students and, and graduate recruitment. Um, when Matt and I met to speak about uh, today's session, we wanted to be uh, kind of clear that we're not here to sell the University of Kent, but we are here to talk more broadly uh, about uh, what's going in higher education and so uh, some of the slides are going to cover off some of the conversations that um, I've been having with heads of careers uh, up and down the country about uh, the state of play and, and, and how uh, things are for us. So I'm going to try and cover in sort of 15 minutes or so um, where the graduates go and kind of understanding the kind of the transients um, of, uh, of students and graduates, uh, try and kind of cover off what's happened in recent years and the impact that's had on students and graduates, and a bit about understanding the graduate recruitment cycle now. Uh, and I'm gonna do those things from the perspective of, of different stakeholders. Uh, and then Matt's gonna kind of come and talk in about some of the ways that um, you can work with universities uh, and some of the things that have kind of um, become available as a result of some of these recent changes. So the, the first thing I'm going to talk about is where graduates go and the sorts of um, the kind of expectations people have that, that students come, 
go to university and then they go off to work in London or um, they kind of come to study and, and disappear off. And there's been some really interesting work done by the team at this organization called Prospects who look at graduate data in terms of employment statistics uh, and kind of produce uh, very regular updates, weekly updates on the graduate labor market and then annual updates on, on graduate employment and movement. And they've done a really interesting piece looking and categorizing um, graduates into four levels. And the first being regional loyals. And so these are graduates who live in a place. So let's say they live in Kent, they study in Kent, and then after they've graduated, they stay and work in Kent. You've also got the regional returners. These are graduates who live in an area, so live in Kent, go off to study in Lincoln, but then come back to Kent to work afterwards. You've got regional stayers. These are graduates who go off to study in Lincoln and then they stay in Lincoln to work. And then you've got regional incomers and they're people that um, live in Kent, study in Lincoln, and then go off somewhere completely new to, uh, to, to work. Okay, so that's broadly the four categories of students. Now, just kind of in your heads on a scrap of paper, have a think about in terms of the, the graduate market, what percentage of each individual uh, of, of graduates do you think go fit into each of these categories? So how many of them live, study and work in the region? Um, how many of them uh, return to their home region to work? How many of them stay where they studied to work? Uh, and how many of them go off somewhere new? So just give you kind of five, 10 seconds just to have a quick think and, and jot that down. Feel free if you're brave to stick it in the chat as well. Okay, so I'm going to move on to kind of give you the answers now. So the loyals, which are the ones uh, that uh, studied and work in the, the same place they live, actually make up the bulk of graduates, and that's 42%. Uh, actually um, kind of remain loyal to their, their region. Um, returners are the next biggest group. And so that's people that go off and study elsewhere uh, and come back to their, their home. And that's 24% of graduates. People who um, uh, are incomers, and so incomers are people that go off uh, somewhere new. They're the next biggest group. Uh, and that is um, just 22%. Uh, and then stayers, the people that go off and study somewhere and stay there, uh, just make up 11.5% of the, the cohort. And so what we can see here is that kind of, people kind of do their degree and go off to, the, 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 to London or the big cities, actually doesn't play out in the statistics. A lot of people stay loyal to where they, they lived and studied. I thought it would be also interesting to look at um, the, um, the breakdown of where graduates go in terms of size of businesses. Uh, and so what we can see here is that, yes, a significant percentage go to the major graduate recruiters, traditional employers who have over a thousand employees. Uh, and that's 67.6% .6 of graduates go to the, the major recruiters. But actually 32.4% go to uh, everyone else. And, with us producing, I believe it's around a million graduates a year, that's still a huge uh, talent pool for people to, to traditionally pull from. So each of those categories actually has, it's about four to 6% in each of the groups. So businesses with one to nine members of staff, about 4% of graduates go to work there. Uh, and those in sort of 50 to 99 employees, it's about 6% go there. Uh, and so it's quite a, a broad spread, but I think what we're seeing in the labor market at the moment is a bit of a shift away from the, the kind of the, the big cities and the, the kind of the major graduate schemes and I'll cover off why uh, shortly. When we think about students, they're a very complicated group because they all have different backgrounds, different experiences uh, and different aspirations and so it can be really difficult to talk about them as a big group of, of, of people. Um, Feedback from other career services is that 40 to 70% of them still haven't decided what they'd like to do after they leave university. That is a huge chunk because often we think about you go to university to achieve a job. 
but actually many of them have come to university and they're still working out where it is they'd like to go afterwards. Uh, and I think this provides a great opportunity uh, in terms of making connections and, and employing some great talent. Um, at least 40% of undertaken work experience, and again, that, that figure fluctuates depending on the institution. Um, but what we do know that's fairly consistent is that students are delaying career decision making. And that ties in a bit with the 40 to 70% in that students are more and more putting off making applications uh, and they're putting off making decisions about where they'd like to go. And part of that reason is that we know that student confidence broadly is lower than it's ever been. And the confidence is lower for a whole variety of reasons, including uncertainty in the labour market, but also the rather unsettled few years they've had. They've not had time to uh, interact with peers uh, and to kind of find out who they are as individuals. But they've also had fewer opportunities to build skills and experience and knowledge and attributes uh, through work experience because opportunities have become fewer and, and, and further between. And so students have less to put on their CV uh, and it also means that they are less experienced about talking about their skills and attributes in the context of employment. Um, and so when it comes to things like interviews and assessment centres, um, they don't have that confidence to talk about themselves in the way that uh, you might traditionally expect a, a graduate to do. Uh, and that lack of confidence feeds back into the delays in making applications because uh, a piece of research I, I've done uh, looking at um, reasons for students not participating in work experience is uh, a big um, element of that was students saying there will be better applicants than me, which is based purely on their own perception of themselves and their own self-worth. And so actually what we're seeing is there are some very, very capable and experienced students who are discounting themselves from engaging in experience and, and graduate jobs because they think that they've missed out on too much. We also know that um, graduate recruiters are bombarding, the, the, and when I talk about graduate recruiters, I am talking about the, the, the sort of massive companies with defined graduate schemes. Um, and what's happened in, in the pandemic is that a lot of them were, that would usually come and do what was traditionally called the milk round, but come onto campus through recruitment activities. A lot of them have moved that activity fully online and many of them intend on retaining that online element because it's cheaper and it's perceived to reach more students. Um, but what's happening is that students are being bombarded with online events and some students are reporting eight to 900 events being sent to them by employers, uh, particularly when they've signed up for job boards and, and kind of done a bit of a scattergun about their interests. They're receiving lots and lots of communications about events and it's actually disengaging the student body because there's a bit too much for them there. Student perceptions of online events are also very mixed because um, there's a perception it's easier to access them, but engagement with them sometimes is a bit less. Uh, and there is also a massive feeling that online activity requires more preparation for, from students in case they're called on. And there is a bit of a fear of actually I haven't had time to prepare for this. I don't know everything about this company. I don't know everything about this sector. I'd rather sit with my camera off or, or not engage. And some report it feeling more like an interview, just attending an information event. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of students asking about, will the session be recorded so they can go back and consider the, the, the event after the fact. One of the recent things in a, a kind of broader trend over a longer period is that students are more and more interested in the company values and the impact the work that they will be doing will have than, than ever before. And that ties in really nicely with the, the, the last ratio session, which looked at um, how you retain talent. Uh, and in particular, what the, the students are looking at is, does this company values align with me and what I want to achieve and the impact I want to have on the world? Uh, and so actually, when you're thinking about recruiting talent from universities, recruiting people with degrees, actually leaning on some of that company values and this is what we stand for will actually be really, really impactful. And you will attract far more students doing this with, with stories and examples. Uh, and salary, whilst salary will always be important, but certainly for those first few steps, salary is becoming less important for, for some, um, not everyone, uh, some will always be driven by money, but I think probably for the majority in attraction, but then retention does become the issue. And so actually as an initial attraction activity, 
uh, values, but then there needs to be the, the remuneration, the, the full package afterwards for, for retention. Um, flexibility in approaches to work, so hybrid working, for example, is really desirable amongst the, the student population, but there are some diversity hiring um, issues with this. Um, so, for example, there's um, space or digital poverty, so lack of a, a suitable workspace or, or lack of equipment that enables them to engage with things like interviews or homeworking. And so these are things that need to be kind of built into, into any consideration around hybrid working. And I think also um, the concept of hybrid working is more desirable for some than the reality. And actually one of the, the kind of nice things about a first proper job is that meeting colleagues and learning through, uh, through experience. And so I think um, hybrid or flexibility working is an attractive thing, but it's not um, necessarily the thing that will determine whether someone takes a job. Um, a further note on diversity, um, universities are incredibly diverse places. Uh, and because of that comes all sorts of positives and, and kind of areas for concern. And so one of those is experience. And so there is a general call from universities to employers to uh, lessen the experience requirements in terms of recruiting graduates, particularly if you're looking at a diverse um, hiring regime. So students and graduates with more complicated home lives will have been more adversely affected by the pandemic than traditional university students. And so some of them will have foregone uh, work experience opportunities to go and work and put food on the table for their family if a family member has lost their job because of the pandemic. And so actually there are life impacts that will remove the ability for people to gain experience. But though these are some of the brightest and best and despite some of those complexities of their lives have actually achieved as much or, as, or more than some of their more traditional counterparts. And so when thinking about the individual, flexibility around experience and looking more for attitude and, and personality and potential is far more important. Um, a lot of work experience is gained through contacts and people from um, a more diverse background may not have access to that. Equally, things like having appropriate clothes for the office, uh, the right shoes or exposure to language and experience can be really challenging. And so when thinking about hiring, um, kind of just thinking about how some of these things are impacting the way you recruit individuals. And that's not to say that you know university students don't have shoes, it's just saying that actually whether they are discounting themselves from participating in activities because they feel they may not have access to those materials. Um, so kind of a final thing around language and applicability, uh, and I think Matt might cover this a little bit more in, in when talking about vacancies, but Students will, because of this lack of confidence or lack of exposure, sometimes discount themselves from jobs that work hard to make themselves sound exciting and big um, because they may not feel that they have the experience to do that. And so actually working with your local university to understand how to position a job is really, really important in supporting uh, students and graduates into the labour market. I think sometimes we think of them as confident, potentially affluent, uh, experienced individuals, and actually there's a, a broad range of individuals. When thinking about uh, employers, and this is just kind of, um, again, some of the research uh, that we've, we've pulled together, um, the bigger graduate recruitment cycle, which used to start in sort of August, September, with deadlines closing from sort of um, October onwards, with graduates then starting, starting in the, uh, the following June, July. Actually, those deadlines are starting to be pushed back because what we know is so many graduates or final year students are pushing back their applications to later and later. And so, whereas the focus used to be for recruitment, uh, graduate recruitment early on uh, and regional local recruitment a bit later, they are gonna start coming together a bit more in, in recent years. What we do see though is that vacancy numbers are broadly at pre-pandemic levels, although there are some, um, some gaps in, in law vacancies, um, and there are uh, significant numbers of businesses reporting shortage of workers. Obviously that's higher in things like uh, hospitality and, uh, and, and food production. In terms of that engagement piece, 
I think there are some interesting um, things to consider. What we're seeing from a, a number of employers is that they're kind of putting up recordings um, that where they've kind of spoken uh, at an event and kind of done that as their attraction piece. But actually, we're working with the Netflix generation who are looking for materials that are purposefully developed for online activity. And so that kind of seamless, slick approach is actually really appreciated by students. Um, we know that online events are not engaged with in the same way. Uh, and in part, that's because a lot of the activities are put on to um, kind of attract, there'll be sales pitches for particular companies, rather than being about supporting the wider learning of the individual, which then in, you know, supports them in, in kind of considering that, that employer in the future. And so I think thinking about the way you pitch online activities or, or activities generally is really important. We're seeing more and more personal engagement activities, sort of keep warm activities from point of offer. And so graduate recruiters are more and more using LinkedIn to keep um, offer holders warm uh, as in the, the kind of the lead up to uh, accepting, um, uh, starting with the organization. Um, and we know that, as I've said broadly, event attendance has, is down, um, as is applications. And we're seeing about 30% reduction in the major graduate scheme application levels. We also know that top students, those that consider top, the more traditional students, um, will still hold multiple offers. And the Institute of Student Employers, who represents all the major graduate recruiters, is kind of staying firm on the, the number of um, offers being reneged in that sphere is around 20%. And so they hold about 20 to 25% vacancy rate in the major graduate schemes because um, the top achieving students hold these multiple offers. But what we are seeing that's really interesting is a move towards employers wanting to be involved in the curriculum or with what they perceive to be mass impact activities. And these are things where you would be speaking to many, many students at once. So you might be part of a lecture uh, with uh, two, 300 students uh, and, and kind of raise brand awareness. Now, Matt and I believe that this is a great way of raising awareness, but actually in terms of building that relationship with the students, there are some more interesting ways of doing that. And so we're going to talk a bit about that as we, we move forward. So the last kind of bit for me really is to, to kind of talk about um, data and numbers. And Antonio did a, a great job of kind of summarizing some of the, the stats that are out there. Um, kind of a, a note on statistics. So we used to measure graduate employment levels at six months through something that was called the Delhi survey. It's now moved to, to um, the graduate outcome survey, uh, which now measures graduate employment at 15 months after graduation. Uh, and those numbers are often compared. But where the 15 month um, number is tricky is that um, if an undergraduate student goes on to do a postgraduate program, they're only a couple of months out of that postgraduate program when they're surveyed. And so actually often people take a few months to find employment after they've graduated. And so the numbers aren't quite comparable. And there are a few issues uh, beyond this with, um, with the data. And so I would always kind of caution any comparative data over the over recent years. Um, it's worth noting also that national is not regional and a lot of these these numbers look at the, the national picture when actually we know the salary range, uh, the average salary range on a regional basis is about £4,300. So salaries do vary um, place to place but also we know that salary is not the only thing with such a huge number of people wanting to work in the place that they've lived and studied, actually localness is a real selling point. And so we should be proud to talk about working in a, a local business, but also you know, graduates will understand that the salaries will not match London salaries, for example. And so that national is not regional is, is really important. And um, a classic example of that is um, Deloitte. I was at a, a partner uh, meeting with them um, a few years ago, uh, and they get um, five times the applications for their London office as they do their Reading office, which is sort of 20, 30 minute train ride down the road. Uh, and so actually, um, it's really interesting that the, the numbers aren't there, but there's a, sometimes a perception that London is better. 
but that's not always the case. Um, uh, and so we need to kind of just um, be proud of the regional stuff because actually the students that want to be regional are more passionate about remaining local. Um, the median salary for graduates is 35, as Antonio said at the beginning, and for non-graduates, that's that's about 25,000. Uh, so there is still kind of a, a salary bump for graduates, uh, but that's again looking at the the national picture. Uh, and when we look at kind of salaries more broadly, um, there is a real range in how different outlets kind of present that information. So the Institute of Student Employers puts that at sort of 30,500 as the average starting salary, but they're only really representing the major graduate schemes, as is High Flyers, which is uh, uses the same number. Whereas we come down to HESA, which is what uses actual graduate salaries, um, that's actually putting the average graduate starting salary at around 24,000 pounds. So there's a real difference there um, in that. And, and the, the HESA data, interestingly, kind of looks at salaries from 16,000 to 90,000, which shows the huge range that's available. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Matt to talk about the ways that you can work with universities. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. James, you want to do the next slide? So my name's Matt, I'm the Employer Engagement Manager at the University of Kent and ultimately my main remit and focus is working with employers strategically to help develop awareness amongst our student populace of opportunities and thus um, create relationships between students and employers, particularly with SMEs. Uh, next slide please James. So in terms of creating the awareness, um, there are various different interventions and opportunities to do so. And to speak about what we do here at the University of Kent, our main principal remit or focus is offering opportunities to speak to students. That could be through workshops and talks. In fact, we run a series of themed weeks throughout the academic year, uh, focusing on different sectors and, and, and areas. For example, we've got a Working in Kent and Medway week coming up in March, we have a Creative Careers Week, we have a week focusing on public sector, we have one on, on science and STEM and so forth. We also have a annual employability festival and careers fair. We host this annually in October where over a two-week period we host typically over a hundred events and with the university backing it with marketing and promotion we see a high uptake of students attending these activities and gaining new skills and commercial insight. Ultimately you need to focus on creating that, that interest, that buzz, that awareness amongst the students um, where sometimes they may just look at a business logo particularly for an SME and fail to identify the true value of working with these organisations. By going in and delivering a workshop it could be on a skill for example how to network how to communicate and so forth you can inspire those students and then close your your talk or workshop with a bit of information on, on your organization and how they can potentially work with you social media also supports that with case studies um, video work uh, and opportunities again just to build up that brand awareness and it's something we look to do throughout the academic year uh, next slide please and alongside creating the awareness, as James mentioned, it's essential for employers look to develop relationships with our students. And the best way to do so is through offering work opportunities. Um, here at the University of Kent, we're incredibly flexible in how you can do so with various different programmes, initiatives and schemes to allow you to engage directly with the student populace and offer work opportunities. For example, we have our job shop. That is a job agency where you can advertise part time employment opportunities. You can work with widening participation students through our work study scheme and offer internships. If you're a NGO, we can work with you to develop volunteering projects and initiatives focusing on community engagement. And we have um, graduate opportunities advertised through our online job jobs platform. Next slide, please. But one of our flagship initiatives, which is perfect for building both awareness and relationships, is the employability point scheme, which is a completely unique to unique to sector approach towards bridging the gap between students and employers. 
Effectively, we realise students sometimes need to be incentivised to develop soft skills and gain relevant experience, and thus we encourage students to partake in co-curricular activities that could be joining student groups, that could be volunteering, part-time work, and so forth. Everything the student engages with, they have to log it onto an online platform, reflect upon their skill development, and we allocate them employability points for doing so. They earn as many points as they can throughout the academic year and we freeze their profiles in March annually. If they reach a certain threshold of points, they can apply for prizes and these include internships, work experience, work shadowing, training opportunities and more. These are all offered by the local business community or employers, principally SMEs. It's a great way to attract and engage with the most motivated uh, work ready students we have at Kemp because by offering it as a prize there's that extra incentive to go for it and to apply for it. Um, furthermore, through the way EP operates is backed up by a humongous marketing and promotional campaign which in turn creates loads of brand awareness. Ultimately it's a really effective tool for small employers to engage with students on a low risk activity such as unpaid work experience or a paid internship which can then develop over time into something more strategic strategic. Uh, next slide please. And the example of that is TMOEP. Um, so to give you some context, I met these guys back in 2014, 2015, and they were looking to build their business around the recruitment of law graduates. Um, the problem they had was they couldn't not only attract the top graduates, they couldn't att attract any graduates whatsoever. They were throwing the jobs out there uh, and they were just not gaining the traction they needed to, to bring, in, bring in students into the business. So we then focused on developing that student awareness with them. They attended our law fair, they engaged with the employability point scheme through offering internships, they, developed, they delivered some talks and workshops during our employability festival. And year on year, as a result, of this when job offers went out adverts went out to the populace they were seeing a greater uptake amongst the students but also a greater uptake amongst the high quality students and they have literally grown from a small business of five or six to about 30 over a five to six year period and when I was talking to one of the MDs recently he does credit the EP scheme specifically as underpinning their recruitment process and develop them into a graduate recruiter of choice next slide please <coughs> and that's it for, for for me and James, unless James has got anything else to add. And does anyone have any questions for us? I think just the, the, the final thing to say is that we've given some examples that um, that apply to the University of Kent, but actually many most universities offer these types of activities. You know, that you can engage them to advertise vacancies and offer internships and work experience and really it's about finding an employer a, a university that works well with you and the, whose students are taught the sorts of things and skills and, 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 and knowledge that you need in your business and so we'd encourage you to kind of open those conversations and find someone that you're comfortable working with and that's the important thing yes um in terms of questions we, we've had a few um that have been raised the first one um, just, just was a point of one of your stats, James. Someone's queried, uh, and I'm not sure w which one it relates to. Um, th th there was a 20% figure for number one. I don't know if you want to have a look at that. Are you ready to answer already? Yeah, no, I think that was a guess on the uh, on the the kind of the first set of of slides. Uh, so close, but not quite. Okay. Super. Um, in terms of other questions we've been asked, <clears throat> we, we've got a question there um, that's been asked about how can we help retain graduate talent? We don't want to fall into the trap of seeing graduates leave at two or three years uh, further down the line. Have you got any particular tips uh, there? I think, so our, our work with, yeah, and I, I can completely understand it because training someone new in a post is expensive and there's a lot of time and effort that goes into that. I think it's about understanding what motivates the individual, uh, particularly for graduates. They're, they're curious and uh, kind of excitable and, and energetic and, 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 and innovative. And it's about finding ways to channel that energy that will keep them engaged. Uh, so, so have some honest open conversations, I think. 
yeah, I think that that's a that's a good point. Generally, I think with with the workforce in general at the moment is the, the communication is often key, uh, and, and you do get the usual comments about people leaving their line managers rather than their their jobs, and that often it can be through uh, lack of communication and uh, uh, and miscommunication. So I think that's always that's always a very good uh, very good tip. Um, uh, another question we've been asked is um, for a SME uh, or small local employer um, that's looking to start recruiting recruiting students, where's the best place to start? I would say speak to the respective career department of your local university and book in a meeting with their respective employer engagement manager. So what I look to always do is meet virtually or physically um, with small businesses and figure out what they actually want to achieve and how we can achieve it. Um, you can't just do the, the scattergun approach and just throw everything out there. It's all about strategically planning what, what the objectives are what are the main stakeholders involved in terms of the student populace and how we can reach those goals um, and it all starts with, with, with a coffee or a conversation. I think uh, that's a, a really important point I think sometimes the, the temptation is to I have a marketing role I'll go and speak to the marketing department or the, um, the, the business school and actually what we know is that students have a lot of transferable skills and so actually speaking to a broader um, range of students you'll find some really interesting candidates and so uh, that's why we would always advocate for going for the career service and then we can pass those relationships on to, to relevant people and departments. Great I think again we may have lost Antonio um, unless there's any other um, questions coming in I think we'll we'll wrap it up there I just want to say thank you very much to, to everyone that's attended uh, on behalf of Bracers and uh, the University of Kent um, I hope you have a, a great Christmas break. Uh, but if you need Matt or myself, you can you can find our details on the University of Kent website. Uh, speak to you all soon. Thanks a lot.